this is our call to action as a church, that we are to go out and we're going to bless, we're going to eat with, and, and we're going to learn with. Uh, that when we, when we bless people, we're just blessing people and, and giving them a blessing in their life, encouragement to just showing them that someone sees them, that they're known. Um, when we eat together, that we engage in life with one another around the table uh, in, in conversation, that, that we do life together. And then that we learn. We learn Christ, not just uh, we teach others about Christ, but that we are learning with them and we're learning from Christ in the process. I, I have a, a, a pastor friend who said, called me up and said, Rick, you guys do the bless, eat, learn, right? And it's like, yeah, that's us. And he said, oh man, do I have a story for you. This is, this is what's happening here, but it's, it's perfect for bless, eat, learn. And he told me about someone that had been in their church for quite some time and that uh, they had neighbors and they hadn't met their neighbors in over... Ten years, uh, they just they never decided to, you know, it's, it's that moment where you're like, oh, it's been too long, I can't go over and say hi and introduce myself. I'm sure some of you are like, oh, I know exactly, yeah, I, I know that neighbor, and it's like, it's already too awkward, you might run into them at the mailbox, and you're like, do I introduce myself? It's already too late, they know which house I live in. Um, <clears throat> well, Christmas time was, is the perfect time for like a redo or a start over, uh, especially with cookies. And I know you might be thinking, it's like, everybody gets cookies on Christmas. Yes, but everyone eats cookies at Christmas, so it, I'll fill it in. Get, make some cookies, bake them, and, and go to the neighbor's house. And so this is what this couple did. They went to the neighbor's finally, you know, after over 10 years, and, and just gave cookies and introduced themselves. And it turns out that their, their neighbors were an elderly couple, and that um, they, they don't get out very much. And so by just introducing themselves, they finally get acquainted with their neighbors. And the next week... Uh, his neighbor comes over to the house, having noticed this whole time that uh, he has a wood shop in his garage. And he finally says, hey, I, I, you know, we were talking and I, I just, I needed some help with something in the house, I needed to work on something and, and I'm wondering if you could help with it for Christmas. So sure enough, they get together, and they start working together in the garage and start building a little bit of a relationship. And then the couple says, well, this, why can't we just take that? We're getting to know them. Let's get to know them more. Let's invite them over for, for dinner. And, you know, they first had hesitation because, like, Christmas season is just so busy. But they, but they made the time. They made the time to invite this, this couple over for dinner. And so they, they gathered together for dinner. And in that process for dinner, they got to actually talk about faith, engage in a lot of different things. And what turned out from there is that this, this couple they hadn't known for over 10 years, came to Christmas Eve that year for the Christmas Eve service. Now, whether or not the, the story that I know is whether they came to Christ, but we always think about like, well, how would we struggle to invite people to Christmas or to invite people to come to church? And what I noticed from this story is, is that the invitations just come naturally one after another. You make one step towards it, and it opens an invitation, an opportunity for us to invite to the next thing. And so I think that's what we struggle with sometimes. Sometimes we just overthink evangelism in a lot of ways. We overthink it because uh, of how we would engage our neighbors or how we would engage the lost. And we interpret evangelism as to be this kind of like, it's got to be big, spectacular. It's got to be effective. It's got to be like the angels proclaiming to the shepherds. Right? Every time we, we come in, we swoop in with suddenness to a person. Have you heard the good news of Jesus Christ? Right? And, it, and it's declared and proclaimed to them in such a, a perfect way. Uh, it, the moment of the multitudes colliding together. Right? You get the full scope of God's glory. You just feel the presence of God as you're talking to them. Uh, the gospel is presented flawlessly. You've rehearsed it in the mirror over and over and over again. And now it's finally performed to its perfection. And then there's utter transformation all happening on, under one package. It, just, it all comes together in that. Right? That evangelism has to meet this somehow this perfect condition, this perfect weathered storm, if you will. And so if you don't see the perfect storm kind of colliding together, you go, oh, it's not, it's not worth the time, right? Only evangelize unless I see all the necessary ingredients, and then we'll go in for the kill, right? As long as it doesn't interrupt our life, right? Because if we have somewhere else to be, something else to do, then also there's like, oh, there's no time. You know, you know how long it takes to go through that presentation? I've timed it. Was I practiced it in the mirror. I know exactly how long it takes, right? We always think that evangelism somehow has to be this heavenly presentation that astounds, that's incredible, that's amazing. And either it's perfect or we're not going to do it at all. And honestly, that is very hopeless. It's a very hopeless cause right there, right? To assure that it will always be big 
that it always be effective, that it will be a polished presentation, a polished presenter will always give it. And it's kind of why we always talk ourselves out of ever evangelizing to other people, ever engaging in this. Because we say, well, it's not me. I'm not polished enough. I haven't rehearsed enough. I, I don't know all the, the necessary steps. Because we somehow we, ev- uh, we elevate uh, and we look to the quality of the deliverer of the gospel and we disqualify ourselves. We say, oh, we don't measure up. We don't, we don't match that. I'm not angel material, if you will. It's interesting that we spend so much time having attention ourselves, but do we ever take time to actually think about who the people that we're supposed to be reaching, right? Because the focus should be on them. It should be focused on the individual that we're trying to reach, the recipients of the good news, right? We said we kind of just blanket over them. They're just like a, they're like a face in a sea of faces. They're just like, well, it's just whoever, you know. It, it, it's more, it more matters about the words that I'm about to say than the actual person who the words are, are reaching, you know. They happen to speak Spanish, but it doesn't matter. I'm speaking in English because that, you know, we pedestal the presenter a lot and we, we downplay the receiver, the person remains kind of nameless. Like, it doesn't matter. Just get out there, say it like this. Here are these three easy things. that you, Like, we, we miss it a little bit. See, when I think of the angels proclaiming to the shepherds, my, I, I know that when you read it, it's like, oh my goodness, what a spectacular view. It's incredible. But all the attention's on the angels, but yet, I, for some reason, I'm drawn to the shepherds. Why the shepherds? That's a big question I have. Why, why the shepherds? Why not kings? Why not the rulers? Why not people of, of high stature, people of, of importance, of influence? I mean, shepherds are common folk. The shepherds are considered the lowly of the low. It's a, it's a profession that nobody wants. It's like, uh, you know, you think the common folk are like, yeah, yeah, but at least I'm not out there with all the sheep. <laughs> at least I'm doing this. But if the angels really wanted to get, think about it, the proclamation of that our Savior has been born, God in flesh is now present, why would the angels go to shepherds, outcasts? If they really wanted to have the most spectacular and most effective proclaiming of the good news and reach the most people, and God are the most importance in the land, why not speak to someone who's viewed as the most important? Why not go to the king? Why not King Herod? After all, that's what the wise men did, right? When the wise men roll into town, they go straight to the king. And they go to the king and say, hey, you surely must know. You must be aware of this newborn king of the Jews. Do you know where he is? That's very interesting, isn't it? What does King Herod do with that information? Because there's a difference between the shepherds and King Herod. Well, first, King Herod, the first thing he does with this information is he assists them. Oh, let me help you, wise men. Let me assist you, and let's, let's find out and pinpoint where exactly this Christ is to be born in the land. And so what I think is very interesting, he gathers all the scribes, he, he gathers all the chief priests, and they pour over the scriptures, and then they find exactly, oh, he's supposed, to be, he's supposed to be born in Bethlehem. And I think what's really interesting is that that information was available to, available to them this whole time, and it's only by threat that someone else, like, I'm sorry, there's a new king in town? I'm not interested in this. And so that's when we decide to go to the scriptures and start reading for ourselves when the Christ is supposed to be born and where exactly. It's been in front of him the entire time, including for the chief priests, including for the scribes. They're supposed to be paying attention to this kind of stuff, and it's only because their power is in jeopardy that suddenly they take the time to find the information. So you can learn a lot about God, and you can have have tons of information about God and have intellectual knowledge about God, but that doesn't ever have you come to be reverent of God, to revere God. After that, Herod then tries to trick the wise men in saying, you go, you go to Bethlehem, and you go find the newborn king, and come back and report it to me so that I too can worship him. Only that's not what he's up to, is it? No. But that doesn't work. They do not come back. God intervenes, says, don't go back. That doesn't work. So what's his next step? Well, because he's 
feeling that, he, he, that his power and his kingdom is in threat, and because he loves those things, he decides, well, very simple procedure. We're just going to kill every male child that is under the age of two. That solves it, right? Now, do you think if the angels came and proclaimed to him, do you think he'd have the same agenda as the angels? Or do you think like, oh, thanks for pointing that out to me. I'll, the, you know, it'll spare a couple other children, but at least I will get what I want. So we often look into the world's methods of what would be the most efficient or gain us the most success, what would bring us the most popularity or guarantee us the largest crowds, even for the gospel, even for Christ, even for the things that we want to do. But it does not mean that those methods that we see working in the world or the people of influence that we could then attach ourselves with would have the same agenda as us, have the same motivations, have the same values. I would say that they might not even value Christ correctly, although they might get on board with you. Yeah, show me where he is so I can worship him too. It might just be that, yeah, because Christ will be useful to me. So of course I support this. So of course I support this idea. I suppose, and this is a theologically observed thing, when I look at the Bible systematically, I look at everything, and when I, so I say, I suppose, that these particular shepherds were the ones that the angels would proclaim to because they're the ones that God called to be proclaimed to. They were created for such a thing. These were individuals the Lord planned to use to deliver his message to be proclaimed, and that these individuals were going to be obedient to do so. That because of their role in society, the Lord actually would then use such a person who, the, who their society deemed foolish, small. But he would use such people because of their profession, so that way it would shame the wise. He would proclaim to those that were declared weak to thwart those who have an agenda and are strong. But also perhaps because it would show the world who the Son of God was coming down to be most like. That Jesus was coming in the form of a shepherd who was going to gather God's people like a shepherd gathers a flock. So I don't prescribe to the idea that these particular shepherds just happened to be in the area. They were nearby where Jesus was born. And so the angels were like, look for somebody, quick, there. And then they just proclaimed it to these people. I don't subscribe to that because this is a very personal encounter. Uh, Mary's interaction with the angel delivering the message uh, that she was going to bear child is very personal. The same for uh, same for, for everybody else that had interaction with an angel. And I think what makes it so personal is it impacts each person's encounter with the angel of the Lord. It impacts their personal relationship with God. It, it's not just random, although you could read it as such as you read this first verse of this, this passage. It says that in, starting in verse 8 of Luke 2, and in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior." who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find the baby wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly, there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those whom he is pleased when the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. They were beautiful. 
What a beautiful sight to have experienced, right? We read passages like this every Christmas as a celebration of God's promises being fulfilled. Um, The joy and comfort of knowing Emmanuel has come to be with us. And that it it is, is the glory of God in flesh with us to be with us, to die with us. It's the beginning of finally, the Old Testament finally coming through. The good news finally here. So we love celebrating Christmas and and focusing on little baby Jesus. But part of the story of Christ's birth is the unmistakable presence of evangelism. It's at the beginning of proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God starts here. The, The beginnings of our activation into our purpose to share Christ with others, it it starts here. It starts with, and this is the best part, it doesn't start with us, it starts with God proclaiming first. So the, the angel proclaims the good news, and the shepherds, they accredit that to the Lord. Why don't they just say that, the, oh, the angels proclaimed it? No, they say, this is what the Lord has made known to us. See, the angel of the Lord, it often just refers to a messenger. And every time that Scripture highlights this, what it's doing is it's trying to get our attention to look to the message. Don't look to the messenger. Look at the importance of the message, that this is divinely being revealed and shared. This is the good news of Christ, that we have a Savior. Here... We hear that message, and that, and that message is revealed through divine glory as it's being shared with the shepherds. It is encasing the shepherds. And when it comes to evangelism, we keep inserting ourselves, and we look at the story like this, and we go, we're supposed to be the angels. No. That's how it's done. That's how we're supposed to do it. We keep inserting ourselves into a role that's reserved for God. Mark DeVere kind of puts it like this. I think many times we don't evangelize because we undertake everything in our own power. We attempt to leave God out of it, and we forget that it's His will, and it's His pleasure for His gospel to be known. He wants sinners saved. You think we want sinners saved? I think sometimes we want sinners saved, but you, now imagine God wanting sinners saved. It outranks whatever kind of passion you have for other people. Whatever, whatever love you have for others that you don't even know, God ten times fold, a hundred fold, sixty fold. I think I covered all the folds that are in Scripture there. So where's our role? If it's really like, man, we leave God out of it, why, why should we not be including God more in it? Obviously, we're called to evangelize. Scripture is very clear about that. Obviously, we're called to proclaim. So where's our role? Well, we need to stop seeing ourselves as angels, first off, right? And start relating with the shepherds. Because what does the shepherds do with what has been made known to them? What do they do with it? They're just like, yeah, that's great. Back to what we were doing. What do they do? The shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. Our role is to be an encourager. We are an encourager of what the Lord makes known, what he's made known to us and what he's making known to other people, and we encourage such things. And how do we do that? Because we say these two things, let's go and let's see. We are go and see. That's our role. And these are two Greek words that are vital in this passage of Scripture, uh, vitally important. Uh, Dereikomai is the first word, and it means to go or to pass through, it, it, to go with purpose. It's not just like, I'm just passing through town. No, I'm on a mission, right? I'm accomplishing a journey. And it's, it's not just a location. It's not like, well, I planned out a traveling trip. It's to go 
in a spiritual mindset to accomplish a purpose or mission or task. The other word is eidemon. It's to see or to perceive, not just with our eyes, but to gain spiritual truth or spiritual understanding, to receive revelation or even to go deeper in our understanding, something that has been given to us by God. So we are to go and then we are to see. All right, so the shepherds are encouraging one another to explore. Let's go explore this thing that's been made known to us. Let's go on this quest. Let's, let's go find the purpose in this stuff being made known to us so that we can better understand it, so that we can see, not just with our eyes, but it can be, our eyes will be open to seeing the goodness of God. Let's go grow in the Lord. Let's not just sit here with these sheep. Let's leave. Let's go. Let's pass through what God has planned out for us, what the Lord has revealed to them. What, what, what has the Lord revealed to them? The, the, you know what's revealed to them? That they need a Savior, that they have a Savior now. And that Savior is Christ. And that, Christ, that, that baby is the Lord. And the Lord has been born. So they, and they've also been given signs of these things. This will be a sign to you, the angel says. It'll be a sign to you, the things that I'm telling you, the facts, the truth that I'm sharing with you, it comes with a sign. And the sign is, and it'll be confirmed to you this truth, is of a baby swaddled in cloth, lying in a manger. They haven't even seen the child yet. They're like, okay, cool, some baby's been born, great. They haven't even seen the child yet. And yet, they're encouraging one another, let's go. Let's go see this child, let's go investigate. Let's gain deeper understanding of what the Lord has already revealed to us. Now, what does that sound like? What does that sound like to you? It sounds like hope. That's what hope is. Hope is for the things that we've not yet seen. Do you understand? We have not seen these things. That's why when Hebrews tells us, it says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, of convictions of things not seen. The shepherds haven't seen a thing of the stuff that the angel of the Lord has, has shared with them. Oh, they've seen the angel of the Lord, they see the multitude and glory of God. And that is confirming one thing. But what's been shared to them, they have not yet seen. Why not, why not build an altar right there? I mean, Peter does it, right? Oh, this is the glory of the Lord. Let's stay here forever. Why are the shepherds picking up and leaving? It's because they now have hope, not just in, oh, I have hope and maybe he'll do it again. <laughs> Maybe there'll be a multitude of angels again. And they'll sing this amazing song. Or they have hope in the things that the Lord revealed to them, that they have a Savior, and that Savior has been born. So let's, let's go. Let's see. Let's trust God. Let's trust God with what he said. I think we can trust God with what he said because of what we've already seen. See, hope isn't just the blind faith out there just thinking, well, I hope it happens. It's all tethered to the experiences and the truth that has been revealed to us already by God. We have anchors that we can always fall back on. Our hope can always fall back on the things that have already anchored us through God. The truth that, and the way that he's revealed to us. So that we can then go and go deeper in our understanding. Go further into mission and purpose to pass through what God has for us so they may have a deeper understanding, so that we may experience and see our real Savior, our actual Savior. See, their faith is assured. God's promises will be fulfilled, so they may go in hope, trusting that the, the Christ will then save them. Let's go see this Christ that'll save us. Our faith journey is no different. Our faith is go and see. See, God has made the realities of the gospel known to us. God reveals himself to us. God has revealed to himself to us in multiple ways. First, it's, it's through creation so that no one is without excuse. There is a God. There is a creator to all these things. Right? We see it, and it's written on our hearts. We also know it through the presence of the Son. The fact that God became Emmanuel shows and reveals us our eternal Father who is for us who loves us. 
But we, he's also revealing himself to us in his word. And his spirit is, is revealing the understanding of his word to us. And we have been given many promises. And what I love most about faith and hope is the assurance I have in the promise that's been made because I've seen God already fulfilled time and time again. And that gives me real assurance into the greatest promise that I have is that I will in death resurrect with him. And so I go in hope of those things. You realize, like, I have not yet seen Jesus face to face. I don't think any of you have seen Jesus face to face. And yet we hope and patiently await for such an amazing moment. And we have hope because of the moment, not because we would really like to be in heaven. Why? We have hope because our Savior has been born, because we know that He has fulfilled the promises that He has laid out over history. He has never broken a promise. Why would He break this one? We can trust and have faith in our God. And so we wait patiently. That's what Advent is. Advent is anticipation. We are anticipating. We are waiting patiently, yet we're super excited about it. Okay, we're going deeper in our understanding. That's why we wait. Why not now? Why not have it now? Because the longer we wait, the more anticipation and the deeper understanding we have of hope and we have a faith, and we have a trust in our God. Our entire faith journey is an anticipation of hope. So we will spend our whole life looking forward to being in the fullness of Christ. You know, Paul himself, although now I think he has, but he writes in Scripture, I have not yet obtained it. I have not yet obtained what I look forward to. He has not yet died, at that time that he wrote it, and he has not yet resurrected with Christ, yet. Although I love in, in one of his books, he says, oh, it's now. <laughs> he's on his deathbed, and he's like, I have graduated. <laughs> it is time. I have fought the good fight. It, it's why we live by faith in God's word, is that hope is a journey of looking forward, yet our hope is assured always by looking back. And that's what Paul's getting to here in Philippians when he says to be found in him, and that is Christ, to be found in Christ, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained it. Not that I've already obtained this, or am I already perfect. But I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. But one thing I do, Forgetting what lies behind, letting go of my shame and my guilt, and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Let's not just keep moving into the future, forgetting everything that God has already done for us. Let us let go of our sinful past. Let us let go of the shame. Let us let go of the guilt. But we've already attained promises made by God. We've already been att- attained what He has made known to us. Let us hold true to that. What we have attained is the truth and the reality of God's word because God has made it known to us. Now, Scripture says that no eye has seen, no ear heard, no heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. But then Scripture says, but these things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. 
So while we hold true to these things, we hope in faith. We trust in Christ and press forward to what what you do not yet have, to dwell in resurrection life. That's what I'm hoping for. That's what my hope is looking forward to. That's the journey I'm on. That's my go and see, is to go and dwell in resurrection life. But the funny thing is, is that how do you share that with other people? How do you evangelize that? None of us, not even Paul, are positioned to be the perfect angelic messenger. Paul, he's not perfect. Paul has to, every time that he talks to someone, someone's going to say, aren't you Saul? He's got to deal with that every time. We've not lived perfectly. We've all made mistakes. And yes, every person that we try to tell them about Christ about the righteousness of Christ, of this new life that we can have, they're always going to point at us and go, didn't you do this? Didn't you do that? You're right. I did. Paul hasn't even attained the object object of his faith. They can say, how do you know? How do you know you're going to have resurrection life? You don't know. You're right. That is a future of mine, and I have hope. But my faith is assured in the hope that I have because it's tethered to the God that I know who's revealed himself to me. And yet, even though it feels like, based on the world's standards, we can't share and tell other people about Christ, that we're not the perfect example, we're not the perfect one to go and do it, Paul notes this in his very next verse. He says, brothers, join in imitating me. And keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. See, so evangelism involves bringing others along in our going and our seeing. It's not the angelic message. It's going and seeing. It's inviting people to imitate our own example of pursuing hope. Watch me. Watch me as I pursue this hope that assures my faith and tethers me to what God has revealed already to me. It, it doesn't, it do, does this mean like live a perfect life or, or don't let them see you screw up? Don't let, them, don't let them see you doubt ever? Don't let them see you stumble? Maybe you don't help. In some, maybe times are hopeless. Maybe right now you're living in hopelessness. According to Paul, it's impossible to live in such a way that, they, that none of those things are ever shown or revealed. Paul himself would say, I don't know why I do what I do. I'm a screw-up. It's impossible. And I will say this, it's pretty inauthentic. It's pretty inauthentic to say, imitate me. Look how good I'm living my life. I don't think, it's not, look how righteous I am. Imitate that. It's look at how I'm going and seeing. You know what people need to see the most in our lives? They need to see the grace of God, which means they have to see our screw-ups. They need to see the truth of God and who He is, which means they have to see who we are and why we're in need of a Savior. And they definitely need to see how grace and His truth plays out in our life, that it actually transforms us, that it actually does something. It impacts our life. It's not just this wonderful saying we say around Christmas time. They need to see the authority of Christ's grace in how we live, what we do next with it, how we keep going and seeing, even though that we make mistakes, even though that we fall short, that we keep going because of the grace of God, and how we know, we know that he has made himself known to us. So look at the the shepherds and their encounter with the angel of the Lord. It says that the angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of God shone around them. Around them. That doesn't, like, you understand the glory of God is so bright that it hurts our eyes. We cannot really look upon it. So if it, it's around them, it'd be like, oh, it's, you know, it's, it's over there too. There's no, there's no way out of it. And what happens to them? They're filled with great fear. They're, they're shown, I mean, 
if you were presented into the, the glory of God, as the disciples were, it says that they drop down pale white dead. It, you just, you, you weaken the knees, you drop, you've got nothing. It, sh- it shows you how weak you are. It shows you how unworthy you are. And we tremble in fear over the glory of God. And this is the best part. This happens in front of other people. The other shepherds are there. They're seeing each other literally falling apart in great fear. Whatever self-dominance or, or pride that those, those guys had, that's gone. They're, they're humbled, and they're humbled in front of each other. And it says that the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. So the, the Lord's grace is shown to him. It's, it's a classic. The fear of the Lord causes us to be a puddle of water. Nothing. And it's the Lord who responds, not us. We don't somehow muster up the strength to withstand the glory of God and say, I don't, I'm not afraid. Instead, it's the Lord who says to us time and time again when you look at Scripture, anytime it says that they, they drop down dead, they, they, the, the fear of the Lord comes upon them, notice what happens right next. God says, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. So grace responds. And in that grace, they are able to no longer be afraid. And God's power, as I love about it, is made perfect in weakness. It's a display of the holiness and righteousness and power. The Almighty God, it shows how powerful He is. And in our weakness, it shows how perfect it is. And then it shows how perfect He is that He extends us grace because of our fear. I got to say this, though. Receiving grace sometimes can be pretty humiliating. Oh, you're spared. (laughs) Thanks. Right? Don't I feel like a fool now? Yes. Yes, you are. That's the point, right? And sometimes it can be very embarrassing for us to pick ourselves up and keep moving forward after we've been basically shown how much of a fool we are. It can be very hard to move forward when we receive grace. Sometimes grace has the opposite effect that we want it to have, and that's because pride is still trying to sift its way through. That somehow, like, look, 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 I, that's great, but I didn't need it because those other people didn't need it. I, I, didn't, I don't need it, right? So instead of allowing pride to have its day in that moment, what do the shepherds do? They're like, whoa, what was that? I don't know, man, but I, I could take it. Instead, they say to each other, they encourage each other along, let's go and see. Don't, don't stop right now. Don't stay here. Don't go back to your lives the way it was. The Lord has revealed himself to us. Life is forever changed. Let's go and see. Let's listen to the word of God and what he has said to us and let us go in hope of the things that he has proclaimed, the things that he has promised. Let us pursue the hope we have now in Christ as our Savior. And so they went with haste, Scripture says. I love that in verse 16, with haste. Then just like think about it, they went and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. And when they saw it, and by the way, that doesn't mean they saw the baby Jesus, like they're calling a baby an it. I just really want to say they saw the sign. They were promised a sign by God that they would find a baby lying in the manger. They saw the sign. They saw it. They made known the saying that was told to them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. So not only is it imitation by authentic living, but it's also by what we proclaim in the way we live. We proclaim what has been made known to us. They tell it to other people. This is what the Lord said concerning this child. And all who heard it were amazed. They were astounded. But they weren't astounded by the shepherds, Scripture says. They were in, they were in awe of what was told to them. See, they were, they were in awe of what was told was the, 
Word of God. That God's Word had been shared, and, and now we have that opportunity too. God's Word has been revealed to us. We have understanding of it, and so we go and we tell other people the Word of God so that they may be in awe of it too. See, God may actually, yes, use us as messengers, but it's not the persuasive words, not the apologetics, it's not the rehearsed lines or the tracks that we create that are going to win people over or bring this kind of wow or amazement or awe. It's when the Word of God is made known. That we, we let God's Word have its moment and we step back and we let it have the day. See, when God reveals himself through his word, who reveals himself through his son, it's the power of his word. It's not our power, it's his power that's going to transform. There's going to be utter transformation because of the power of God, not the power or persuasiveness of us. And it's why we encourage other people, we encourage you, read the Bible. Read the Bible for yourself. Discover the word of God. Allow the spirit to work through These are the revealed words of God for our hope. They're given for us, for our own hope and our own faith to be assured. But the the Spirit also calls us to proclaim the understanding that we actually have from what the Lord has made known to us. So we engage, we share what we're learning, what we're growing deeper in about God. We walk through it with other people. We don't just say and then we leave. We engage with others. See, God involves us, but it's not at the expense of his own involvement. So we need to understand, what, what exactly are we sharing? You realize, like, we, we have it messed up a lot. Because we think sometimes it's like, we're sharing because the people need to hear right now that you can have a better life. And so we're just preaching Jesus because Jesus offers you a better life. But everyone's thinking about this life right now. You mean the more things I can have? I can feel better here? Yeah, those are all, like, side effects to what we're really talking about? Because what we're talking about is resurrection life. (laughs) And that's a hope we're going to have for the rest of this journey and we're going to carry. Maybe sometimes we're confused. We think it's moral behavior that we're trying to tell. Listen, listen, you can live a better life and you could live correctly and live like a good life. You could could do the right thing. No, that's not enough. Because then they start thinking, it's like, cool. So then they start judging and go, well, you don't always do the right thing. Yeah, yeah, I'm trying my best. Right, but that's what I mean. Well, so Christians are a bunch of hypocrites. And that's how we fall into that trap because we're trying to convince people. Every time we're trying to convince people about Jesus, it's all about how Jesus is here in this lifetime. And we forget to talk about that you actually need true repentance to be able to get to a resurrection life. We gotta be weakened and we gotta have the power of God transform our life. And that'll affect the way we live and people will see that and know that. But everything, all that hope is not that my family will uh, be better, Christmas will be less hectic because I'm right with God. It'll be because I have hope in resurrection of Jesus Christ that when I die, I will rise again with him and may live with him forever and dwell with him forever. Everything, and if we really hold to that hope, everything else is impacted. Then Christmas might be a little bit better, less hectic, less stressful then our relationships with each other might be a little bit better. Yes, but that's not the reason why we have a Savior. That's not why Christ came. So we need, to, we need to know what we're sharing about, what God has actually made known to us. I'll go back to Mark DeVere's again. He says this, You and I aren't called to use our extensive powers to convict and change the sinner while God stands back as a gentleman, quietly waiting for the spiritual corpse his declared spiritual enemy, to invite God back into his heart. Rather, we should resolve to preach the gospel like gentlemen, gentle, persuading while knowing we can't regenerate anyone, and then stand back while God uses all his extensive powers to convict and change the sinner. Then we'll see clearly who it is that can really call the dead to life. And although he uses us in doing it, it's not you and I who are actually doing it. So our whole role is the same as the shepherds 
and has, has the same motivations that cause them to share. So it says in verse 20, after Mary has treasured up these things, it says in verse 20 that the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen and what had been told to them. They worshiped God because they were holding on to his word. They were trusting God, and it causes them to worship God. That he has provided them a savior. And, they, and because of this, the effects happen. Because they worship a God who they now know and understand as love, as hope, they spur each other on. They told each other, let's go, let's see. And they're able to explain why they have hope. They explain the things that have been made known to them. It's not just like, wow, well, you know, it's crazy, there was an angel. They share the word of God with other people, the hope that they have. And now they continue to praise God in faith. So true evangelism is the discipling of others through our journey of hope. It's not just living a life with others and being of a good influence on them. It's, it's not bringing people to like being good, living righteously. It's bringing them into your experiences with grace and mercy and God's truth and going and seeing. And it's all with us. Come along. Come with me. But it's also being prepared for when that time comes. Tell me why. What are the reasons that you have hope? Why do you hope for such things? Oh, because of what God has made known to me. That's why in 1 Peter it says, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. That is the utmost thing. When it comes to evangelizing, we need to revere Christ as Lord. We need to see Jesus as our Lord. And that way we'll always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks for the reason for the hope that we have. But do this with gentleness. Let's be gentlemen about it, okay? With gentleness and respect, we must share our hope.